seated. If you take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 28, uh, this will be on page three, no, there's a three in there, hang on, 937 in the Pew Bible, and there is an outline, the title is Ministry in Malta, Acts 28, 1 to 10, and an outline here, Welcome to Malta, the Lord preserving Paul, the ministry of healing, and the legacy of unplanned ministry. I think you found the place. Let's hear again the word of God here in Acts chapter 28. After we were brought safely through, then we learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, though he escaped, just, uh, he escaped from the sea. Justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune had come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were the lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius uh, lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people of the island who had diseases also came and were cured. And they also honored us greatly when we were about to sail and they put on board whatever we needed. This is the word of the Lord for us. Let's pray. O oh Lord, open our hearts to your word that the reading and especially the preaching of your word would be an effective means to convict us, to convert us, to build us up through comfort in Jesus Christ. Amen. Malta is not a very big island. It's about 90, I think it's less than 95 square miles and to put that into perspective, that's like a hundred times smaller than Sicily. Sicily's that kind of football-shaped triangle at the end of the boot of Italy. You kind of expect it to give it a little kick. Oh, you, you don't have as much imagination as I do, maybe. Anyway, it's, it's not a big place. It's a place that someone might stop at. It's been a place of seafaring people for as long as anyone can remember. In fact, the, the paleo historians say, well, I think they're connected to the Phoenicians. Well, the Phoenicians were the ones on the sea coast near Israel, and they were all seagoing people. So these are people that are used to boats and people that live on a small island in a sea where there are great storms are also rep used to shipwrecks and things like that. Not a big place. It was not on what I would consider to be their, their travel itinerary. After all, Paul's trying to get to Rome. It took him years to get to Rome. He had that long stay in, in Caesarea, in the, in the prison or the jail, in custody, we'll put it that way. And then the great storm that they had put them on Malta. They didn't even know where it was. Now the book of Acts finishes, it, it culminates with Paul getting to Rome the heart of the empire, the capital. He had visited other really important cities like uh, Ephesus, that was the regional capital for that area of Asia Minor. Uh, 
Corinth. He spent time there. That's a, a place that's very, very important. He went to other big cities. He went to little cities on the way, but they were kind of on the way to big cities. Here he comes to a small place. He brings Christ here. The Maltese are very aware that they've had a Christian presence there since, since Paul was there. In fact, where did he crash on the island? Well, they think it's probably the place they call St. Paul's Bay. You know, this is St. Paul's, this is where it would be. And it actually makes good sense. Uh, they had to battle against Muslims who tried to chase them out with a sword, and they were able to, to regroup. But it's something, the witness that they may even think, you know, well, Paul brought the gospel here before he brought it to Rome, even. Something I'd like to take deeply to heart, though. God cares about small, out-of-the-way places. We are on a road, well, Interstate 81 is right behind us, but we're on a way that there's not so many people here. Does God care about the people in not so many people places? The answer is yes. Whether it's in a little corner of Virginia, or it's up in the coal fields, or it's down in pockets in Tennessee or wherever, or whether it's in the Andes Mountains or on the Amazon River Basin or in places in Ethiopia, places where our missionaries have been and are. He cares about that because it's the word of life. God brings the word of life. Well, the first point I have here is welcome to Malta. Now, since the chapter 27, if you were here last week or you know this, it's, it's a really breathtakingly dramatic chapter. And I feel like I need to begin the way the old radio broadcasts were. It would, it's like, when we last saw our heroes, they were bravely making it through the storm and they got crashed onto the sea. Right. They all made it to land. And then that, that verse where it says, and so it was that they were all brought safely to land. This is, it is an amazing thing that's happened. Uh, what would they find when they get there? If you have a King James Bible, it will say uh, in the second verse, the native people, it says the, the, they were barbarians. And don't get too excited. Barbarian just means that they didn't speak Latin or Greek. And what they spoke sounded like the language they couldn't understand. And so these were people, they were, as we'll find out, they're what we would call good folk. Now I know we all sinners, we all need a savior, but if you'd say that eh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good guy, or that's a, they're, they're good folk, you know what I mean. The people that'll help. That, that's how they seem to be here. Now, did they worry that these, these might be hostile? They didn't even know where they were when, until they got there because they had no idea. They had no idea for days where they were in that storm. Turns out the Lord sent them to a place that was not only not hostile, but a place where the people would be open and to take care of them. Again, looking at that first verse, when we were brought safely through, whew, we learned that the, the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness and they kindled a fire and welcomed us because it began to rain and was cold. Now, I've never been in a shipwreck. I have never had to swim through choppy seas to get to land. I will say I could understand that that's really exhausting. Now, I'm a swimmer. I mean, I've swum miles, but I've also swum in the chop and that's exhausting and it's been storming, and you're going to be wet, and you're going to be cold. They came with nothing except the sopping wet clothes on their back. Did they have money? No, they wouldn't have had money. What would you do with gold if you're in the ocean and you're trying to swim for shore? You let it sink. 
Oh, but it's gold, and it'll kill you. It'd be an anchor. Do you know the density of gold is 14 times the density of water? That may not mean anything to you, but some of you it does. It means it sinks big time. You do not want to have that tying you to the ground. And so they have nothing. And the Maltese, being seagoing people, knew what it was like for a shipwreck. I'm sure they'd seen some before. They knew what it was like to be exhausted and cold. And so they built them a fire. And I really love this. It's that they sh showed us unusual kindness. Now Luke's going to come to this several times here about how kind these people are and how much he appreciated it. You know, unusual kindness. They're open to other people, kind to strangers. They provide because these people need it. They're not working some sort of an angle. It's really nice to have good neighbors. You know, if you're out and there's a problem, uh, people come to your aid. Maybe your, your car won't start. Have you ever had your car not start? Well, of course. Oh, I don't know. Maybe you've always had a car that starts. And someone says, could, could, could you give me a jump? Oh, yeah. Sometimes they'll say, oh, I don't, I don't even have cables. So that's okay. I've got them. You know. It's good to carry them, by the way. It's good to be able to get to them, by the way. You, it's, it's wonderful when someone is there to help, to be that person and to have that person. People are a little more apt to help when they knew what, know what the problem is. I remember years ago, I'd run out of gas. It was a divided four, four lane. I mean, it was not the interstate, but it was, um, well, you, you know the kind of street that it's like. And I was walking along and trying to hit to the gas station, which I knew was about a mile or so back there. And nobody would, oh, what's this guy hitchhiking? We don't know about that. As soon as I got there and I got a gas can and I filled it up, and I started walking back, put my thumb out, immediately someone stopped because they said, oh, this guy's run out of gas. Uh, I can give him a ride. And he, they just took me right to it. It's really good when that happens, you know. Uh, to quote one of the lines of the barter play that's on now, Grandma Gatewood takes a walk, who actually quotes from a Tennessee Williams play, you know, I have always relied on the kindness of strangers. <laughs> Kindly people are just, it, it does your heart good when that happens, right? But there's an important point here related to our text, and it's this. They seem to be good people. Good people need Jesus. You don't have union with God and forgiveness of sin because you're a good person. You do it because you have Christ. There is a sweetness about some people. Do I love that? Yes. It's much nicer to be around them than those who are not sweet. But they need Jesus. And the Lord sent Paul to the Maltese that they would know. So people around you, share Jesus. Continue to pray for them. Pray that you'd be able to show Christ. Now Paul's introduction to the Maltese takes a turn as they gather the wood, and of course they're all gathering wood, and he's gathering some wood. Verse three, it says, bundle of sticks he gets, and he puts them into the fire, but there was a viper in there and fastens onto his hand. Now, snakes, they get, when they're cold, they could be like, look like a stick even. But I tell you, when they start to move, uh, that makes you take notice. And this was one that was venomous. They knew it. Viper, they're vem venomous. They, they got the poison that'll kill you. That's what they were concerned about. And so they saw that this thing had bit him and it latched on. So they knew he was in trouble. And it says in four, verse 4, when the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man was a murderer 
And though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Now the word justice is capitalized here because they had a God. They were pantheists, they believed in all kind of gods, and they had a God that was justice. And justice would look out to make sure that that person's going to be dealt with. Somehow, right will prevail. Actually, if you believe that somehow justice should prevail, that's a good thing too. Even though they were pagans, that's a kind of a good thing that they were thinking. But it's a bad thing in that they don't understand God's justice and what happens through Christ. But they're going to be told. They're going to find this out. They're going to have not only their view of Paul changed, but they're going to have their whole worldview changed. Isn't it something? They knew that Paul was a prisoner. There were prisoners on this ship, and here was one of them, and they didn't know what he did, but something happened. By the way, don't assume that you know what's going on. Oh, God did that to that person because something they did. Yeah, I don't think you know that. Don't make those judgments because they're going to find out something very different here. Second point here is the Lord preserving Paul because the Maltese were completely wrong about Paul. He didn't escape justice. All 276 of the souls on board were alive because of Paul. The angel told Paul, you're going to make it to Rome. And by the way, I'm going to grant you the souls of all these that are with you. They're all going to survive. And he told them, look, God told me. You didn't listen to me before when I said we should have stayed in Fair Havens. But God told me that we're all going to survive, but we all stay together. There's going to be a shipwreck. We're going to have to make it for the shore, but we'll all survive. He would be there. Paul knew he was going to make it to Rome. God told him. Jesus said, we're going to do this in Rome. I'll be there with you. But they didn't know this yet. Verse 6, it said they're waiting for him to swell up or fall down dead. And then nothing happened. Right? No misfortune came to him. Maybe he's a god. Maybe he's like one of these gods that come down. I can actually see this. They start to say in their language that maybe the people who spoke Greek and Latin didn't get exactly, but they started pointing toward Paul. You know, that one, that one got bit by the viper. That one, probably a murder or something. I mean, why would that happen? He's going to die. And, and that would kind of go around. And they keep looking and they say, hey, nothing's happening to him yet. And they keep looking and in fact he has no, he doesn't act like he was bitten at all. Maybe he's one of their gods who's come down. What a change that was. Of course, there was another time, he was in Lystra, I believe, and uh, they, they thought he was a god there. and they, they brought the sacrifices out. They were going to do a big sacrifice, and he stopped them. He says, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not a god. Don't do this. I serve the living god. And then later, they got so upset, they stoned him and left him for dead. None of that happened here because you know what? Seems like the Maltese are kind of good folks. They'd be good neighbors. The Old Testament reading also dealt with God protecting his messengers from poison. The sons of the prophets, that's kind of a prophet school. And they are out gathering and threw something in there they shouldn't throw in. By the way, I, I don't trust myself for finding stuff and eating it on trail. Occasionally, I'll recognize it. Okay, I know what blueberries look like. I don't think they're out yet, but you got to get them before the bears do. There was something thrown in that was poisonous. And they can look to the untrained like they'd be good, colorful. And yet the Lord protected these from the poison. Uh, the prophet said, you know, throw some... Sow some flour in there, stir it, okay, it's good. That's not a scientific way of getting rid of poison. That's not the point. The point is that God was delivering them 
because he was delivering them. I mean, it was by the, the, the messenger of God, and that's the way it was done. So, it's also a direct fulfillment, really, of Mark 16, 18, where it says, these signs will accompany those who believe. It says they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, Paul actually did pick up the viper with his hand. He didn't grab it. It grabbed him. And nothing happened. Later, he's going to lay hands on uh, Publicus's father and, and pray for them, and he'll get, they'll recover, which, like that verse says. Now, what we see here is a demonstration of God's power through Paul for the effectiveness of communicating the gospel. In no way are we going to take snakes and handle them in the service on purpose. Yeah, it happens. You know what that does? That is not showing the glory of God. That's showing the spectacle of the person who's doing it. To do that sounds a lot like what Satan said to Jesus when he took him to the top of the temple and said, you cast yourself down because the word says, in the very psalm that we read together, right? His angel will bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And what did Jesus say? It is written, do not tempt the Lord your God. It's not about making me a spectacle. All that's done is to glorify God. You sh it also talks about those with poison with... Uh, the church tradition says that they tried to poison the Apostle John, and it didn't work because the Lord had other plans. Third point we have here is the ministry of healing. Now, I will say this. I find it really interesting here. It doesn't talk about Paul preaching at all in this whole time. He's been there. He's going to be there several months, it seems, until it's time to get on another boat and head towards Rome. And yet, there is a ministry of preaching that will happen here. Why do I say that? Paul spends three months in a place and doesn't talk about Jesus. No, that's not going to happen. Paul spends three days in a place and he doesn't talk about Jesus. That's not going to happen either. This is who he was. Paul preached wherever the Lord took him. When he was there in prison, he would be chained to a guard and he'd share the gospel to the people of the guard and they'd become Christians. There were Christians in Caesar's household because they were Caesar's guards guarding Paul. It didn't matter where he was. He's going to do this. I think the reason it's not recorded is because generally speaking, Paul goes to the synagogue. Is there a synagogue there? No. Paul goes to the public places and begins to, to preach in, in Greek like he did in Athens or other places. Remember, they don't have that language. It's not going to go in that way. But there's a ministry that happens. It comes through healing that people are gathered and they weren't going to know about Jesus. The power of the gospel is seen by everyone in the, in the island. First, the fact that Paul doesn't die. And then later, when this healing comes through him. Again, verse 7. In the neighborhood, there was a place that lands that belonged to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. That chief man of the island, that's really an identifier that the Romans did have control here. And so this would be the person who would have the Roman presence and garrison. Is it a big one? Probably not. There's not that many people. Plus, they don't seem to be as troubled and troubling and difficult to rule as the folks in Judea were. That was a hard place to rule. Here, they just seem to take care of it. And 
uh, Julian, of course, he's a centurion. Where's he going to go? He's going to go to the Roman presence, and it's not just him, but he seems to have, if not everybody, a large part of him. I mean, Luke's saying, we, he's part of this. You know, the hospitality of these islanders must have been quite a relief after not eating for weeks on the sea and having nothing left. But it also became an a, a event for ministry, a, an opportunity for ministry. It says in verse 8, it happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, putting his hands on him, and healed him. Now, Paul is not just a dinner guest at this house. He was a house guest for three days. When you're at a dinner guest, you do dinner guest parties, or dinner guest conversation. When you're a house guest, you talk about other kind of things. And he finds out, and he's asking, maybe he asks, well, what about your family? Well, my father is ill. Really? Where is he? Let me pray for him. By the way, pray for people and volunteer to. I've not yet ha heard anyone say, no, don't pray for me. No, everyone, if they don't even believe, seems to what prayer, do it. If they say, no, don't pray for me, well, then don't do it out loud. They can't stop you, nor should they even think they're able to from anything in there, but okay, fair enough. Uh, Things got beneath, the, the conversation got beneath the, hi, how's the weather, I guess it's clearing up kind of thing. And he found out about his father, and he offers to go pray. Now, I've prayed for people to be healed, and it has been, sometimes the Lord has seen fit in his providence to bring healing. And that's really a, a wonderful thing. Uh, not always. Not immediately. Sometimes pretty immediately. But it's always good to pray for people because I believe it shows love. And it also is a way to honor Jesus because you pray through Christ. You show God's love. Am I comfortable in the outcome if they're healed or not? I better be because one of the things I believe is that God is the sovereign ruler of the universe. And you know who's not? Me. I mean, I, I don't know if I want to be, you better be good with that because it's the truth, right? And he is our father who loves us. How wonderful is that? He is the almighty one. Do I want it to be the way God would have it? How could I want it any other way? Oh, but it's not the way you prayed. My job is to cast all my cares upon him and my cares for other people too and then for him to, to, to care for me. That's it. Trust the Lord. What happened here, he prayed for him and he healed him. It's a lot like what happened with Jesus as we read the Gospels. Look at verse 9. When this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They came. You remember that with Jesus? They, they came. They came and they waited. And some of them are like, I don't know if I can get through this crowd. Maybe if I can just touch the hem of his garment. The people were brought. There's kindness here. People bring their sick. They receive healing. And you know they're being told about Christ. Again, consider what the Maltese saw. A shipwreck with 276 souls aboard. All of them survive. Then this Paul, who's bitten by this viper and doesn't have any effect at all. And now he prays for the chief man's father and is healed. And they bring others and they're healed. They all do this. This is accompanied by the teaching of the gospel. How would I know? In whose name were they healed? In the name of Jesus. There's, he's 
talking and demonstrating about Jesus. Well, Luke doesn't actually mention it here, does he? Again, Paul, three months on an island, is not going to talk about Jesus. Even with a language barrier, and that's part of it, Paul heals, and the people hear in translation, and they would have asked this question. What came ashore when this man came ashore? And it's not a God of him. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The real gospel came ashore. This was real. These are people who believed in kindness and believed in justice, and now they saw the kindness and justice of God in Christ. There is a tradition that Publius becomes the first bishop of the church in Malta. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but he was named. And a lot of times these people are named for a reason because they're still in the church when Luke writes. Verse 10, they honored us greatly when we were about to sail. They put on board whatever we needed. Third time, you know, they were very, very kind to us. They, they had exceedingly great hospitality. And now they honored us greatly. The kindness, they're unusually kind to us. They make sure they don't leave them empty-handed. There might have been a language barrier, but there's no barrier of love here. And difficult times ahead, difficult times behind. What a nice respite this was. I guess Malta is still a place that people in Europe like to go to for vacation. Maybe I want to go. I don't know. The last point here, and this is briefer, the legacy of unplanned ministry. Again, this was not on the list of ports of call according to the ship's uh, captain or pilot. Technically, it wasn't a port of call. A port of call is when your boat comes into port and you get off and maybe get back on. The boat didn't make it. They made it. The Lord had this all planned. And this unplanned stop became a place of ministry. Unplanned ministry, perhaps, but ministry. There are other places where Paul ministered and was driven out. That's not what happens here, is it? They are saying, here, take what you need. We're grateful you've been here. These are our people that did Christian things. And even still, Christ is honored on the island. Now, the point, I think, for us is this. You will get opportunities for unplanned ministry. The Lord will bring into your path people that he has you there to minister to. You there to speak or to do what is needed what will you do when that happens? Will you be ready to do that ministry? Maybe you've run out of gas and you're going to have a, an unplanned contact with people. Maybe you're the one who helps someone who ran out of gas. That might be a, not just a time to be neighborly, but a time for ministry, to speak about spiritual things. And I will say, if your mind is thinking on spiritual things, you will be more likely and open to what's going on and see the ministry in front of you. God makes appointments. Be ready for them. People that come into your place of business, come into your path, and pray for them. Lord, who will you place in my path today? How will you interrupt my schedule today? Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. You know, without me you can do nothing. Abide in me. When you're abiding in the vine, all that life comes 
and the fruit comes. Bear fruit. We do this because we abide in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father, you have indeed sent your Son, our Lord Jesus, to be our Savior. And for this we give you great praise. We do trust in him alone for our salvation, as you presented in your gospel. He is our connection to you for forgiveness, by your spirit, the power to lead holy lives, lives that are useful for your purpose. We are so encouraged as we read how even you turned a shipwreck into a place of ministry, unplanned ministry, a fruitful ministry for Paul. Lord, in the difficulties of our lives, show us your presence and the opportunity for unplanned ministry. Show us how to share that hope that we have in us. May your life and love flow through us by Jesus.